Um, well, hello everyone. Um, it's really great to be back here. Actually, um, I was over on the other side of campus. Actually, I don't know which side of campus I was on. <laughs> I, was, I was at the Union at one point, uh, like two weeks ago, two or three weeks. When was it, Jason? Like three weeks ago? Three weeks ago. Um, and so I just liked it so much, decided to come back. Um, and yeah, it's, it's great. Uh, there's so many similarities between Ann Arbor and Madison that, you know, it feels very comfortable to be here. Um, anyway, uh, I'm also just really happy to talk about this. Um, let me actually start a little bit with, um, yes, please feel free to interrupt, by the way. And um, uh, yeah, we'll just go that way. It's a sufficiently vague title that you don't know what's coming. Um, but let me describe a little bit more about who I am, because that might help you uh, know what questions you can and shouldn't ask of me, I guess. Um, so I got my PhD in sociology. I also got a, a master's in statistics from the University of Michigan, uh, mostly in family demography, as you just heard. And it was looking at contextual effects on values and beliefs and family formation behavior. So kind of, uh, you know, Harlan Thornton and Bill Axe and Jennifer Barber were the people who trained me. Um, uh, what wasn't happening during that dissertating uh, process was I was also had this really big interest in biology and luckily I had uh, an advisor who said I think that this is what you should be doing going forward um, take all the classes you want um, uh, he also said to be honest uh, maybe don't tell all of your sociology colleagues quite yet um, so I took a lot of courses in uh, genetics and uh, molecular biology um, some neuroscience courses um, and that prepared me for uh, what ended up being incredibly uh, fortuitous which was uh, meeting Sarah McClanahan um, at a talk when I was a graduate student and she mentioned oh we've collected spit in the fragile families and child well-being study but we don't really know what to do with it and I literally said oh I've been taking all of these biology courses I don't have any data to work with so it was great um, and so I went uh, to work with uh, Sarah McClanahan and Dan Notterman, who is a molecular biologist and pediatrician at Princeton. I pretty much started my, uh, my whole time working with fragile families. That was uh, quite some time ago now. Um, and so then I was hired back in 2012 at the Survey Research Center um, at the Institute for Social Research as really to start kind of, we're gonna now start doing this on all of our data sets. So we need more people like you. So um, I'm not going to talk about all of this. I'm putting it up there if you want to ask questions about it, uh, either studies or I'm not going to really talk about genetics. Um, well, my career started with gene environment interaction. Not going to talk about it. Um, uh, uh, genome wide association studies, not really going to talk about those. Polygenic scores I'll mention briefly. Um, I work on the health and retirement study with Jessica Fall, Aaron Ware and Lauren Schmitz. Um, the Chitwan Valley Family Study, which is where I did my dissertation, we are now collecting, so we've already collected saliva, we're now genotyping them to do mental health research there, um, and that's with Bill Axon. The Michigan Twin Studies uh, to do epigenetic and neuroimaging uh, with Luke Hyde and Alex uh, Burt. Panel Study of Income Dynamics, you may not know, they also collected saliva and have genotyped them, um, and that's, uh, that's coming out pretty soon with Narayan Sastry and Paula Fomby. And then finally, um, I am a director of the ISR Biospecimen Lab. So we consult with, um, at this point, over 20 different studies on how to collect biological data in the field, uh, mostly social science studies. Um, so, you know, feel free to ask me any of your questions related to that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there we go. Um, so why even study this? Biological consequences of social disadvantage. Um, we've actually seen a, in the last decade, and I might even say the last uh, 15 years now, we've seen this massive increase in biosocial sorts of work, um, uh, including from uh, someone who's, who's here at this university as one of the editors. Um, and so initially this work focused on things like uh, blood pressure, or glucose, cholesterol, um, but has rapidly moved to molecular level and brain. Um, and so that's kind of the world that we're living in right now. Um, the thing is, is not all populations are equally represented, and that's kind of been what I've been dealing with my whole career uh, to some degree. Uh, and I'll get to talk about that more. So, you know, what I really am interested in is things like poverty and SES, uh, as well as parental uh, in, uh, 
family instability, uh, parental incarceration, and how that influences child health, but maybe mediated through biology or moderated with biology. So um, just as a talk on this general, I, I understand you guys have had a fair number of biosocial sorts of people here recently. Why should social scientists even care about this? Uh, Ideally, you know, what we sell this as often, and, and you'll hear this with epigenetics in particular, which is what I'm going to focus on, is um, it's all about the mechanisms, right? We can find mechanisms that link social things to uh, health, and it'll be great. We'll learn all these great mechanisms. That sounds really wonderful. Incredibly hard to do, and we're at the beginning. Um, we were just talking about this with Felix, that how hard it is to find a good mechanism. Um, I actually see there's another side of it, which is just uh, you have indicators, biomarkers, right? And I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, with epigenetics shortly. Um, there's a whole group of people who just want to control out variation in the outcome um, so that they can really have a better estimate of uh, the social effects on health. Um, so there's a whole group of people who just want to control for the genetics of said disease, and then you can have uh, a better estimate. And I will say that in general, most of my work has really found that once you control for some of these genetic measures, just controlling for them, it really highlights and makes it a little easier to detect some of these social uh, effects that, you're, that we're all interested in. Uh, moderation, um, this is where my career started and I've actually backed off substantially in part because it is so hard to do and to find something. And I won't be doing any of that today, but uh, happy to talk about it. But maybe potentially the thing that I'm most interested in and I think social scientists should care about is biological data is not equally represented, um, both in two, in two ways. I'll, I'll show you a slide on this in a second. Um, but we care tremendously about that. Uh, our data is based often on population-based studies. I'm, I'm here at a demography center, uh, and, um, and that's not true for most biological data. Um, and finally, in this, you may or may not like this part, we are in the age of biology. Um, when I, the story I usually tell is when I wrote one of my first papers on telomere length, and I said poverty influences t the telomere length of children. Um, I got so many reporters who called, and they're just like, "This is so amazing that bio that poverty really has this effect, this massive effect." I was like, "Actually, that's not the new part. We've always known it has a big effect on health. Um, we all know that, right? I mean, that's that's pretty pretty well documented, and yet." A lot more people were interested because it had this biological component. Um, good or bad, it is what it is right now. Um, funders care about it tremendously as well. Okay, so whose data do we actually have? Um, so one thing to know, in most biosocial surveys, this is more true of like neuroimaging data than it is of genetic data, um, but it's clinical or community-based data. Um, and so uh, one example that has more population-based data, there's Social Science Genetic uh, Consortium is, has quite a bit more population-based data, but still pretty rare. The other thing is, is the difference between recruiting and sampling. It's not uncommon for most biosocial studies to recruit. So if you go to a, a classic neuroimaging study, it's, uh, they get them from handing out flyers uh, in, in certain places, in clinics or in uh, you know, if you go to Michigan and I walk around East Hall where psychology is located, they're all over the place. We need uh, people of these ages who have this uh, disease or this exposure and please come in and we'll give you $100 to sit in an MRI. Um, so does it represent uh, the human population? The answer is probably no. Um, in psychology, at least, they, they have this term, a weird sample. You guys heard this before? Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Um, I think you could actually have a, another W on there, which would be white. Um, and so in psychology, 95% of the data come from 12% of the population. Um, there's been several different uh, studies showing uh, low representations of minorities and ethnic populations in the U.S. medical studies. And fewer than 20% of genetics uh, study participants are non-European ancestry. And only 5% when you exclude uh, Asian ancestry. So why does that matter? For all the reasons that you guys already know. I won't go into that too much more. So why, with that in mind, what ended up happening is I had this wonderful opportunity to work in fragile, the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study. It is a very different sample than almost all of the studies I just described. 
which has been both wonderful and also really challenging because a lot of times people don't believe it or the worst measures don't work as well. So fragile families and child well-being, um, I think you guys probably recognize this as a probability sample. It's a birth cohort sample, 20 U.S. cities uh, of large, uh, large cities in the United States um, between 1998 and 2000, 75 different hospitals. Oversampled for non-marital births um, resulted in, uh, because of those selection criteria, resulted in some really interesting demographics. Uh, so only 21% white compared to what I just told you, pretty dramatically different. Um, also, uh, much lower uh, SES, um, both in terms of uh, uh, income as well as education um, than most of the studies. So, Fragile Families uh, has had 15 years of data collection. I'm proud to report, actually, that our youngest person just turned 18 last month. Uh, and so, it's kind of exciting. They're now adults, which is crazy. Um, and uh, so, we have birth age one, age three, age five, age nine, age 15. There's a lot of data. Please go to the website if you're really interested. Happy to talk about it. You have some experts in the room as well. Um, the thing that's potentially really interesting for you is at age nine and age 15 for this, we collected saliva um, on all of the, the mothers and the kids at age nine and all the kids at age 15 um, that were participating. And what you don't see on here is that there's a subsample that we also did neuroimaging on of about 240, and that'll come up later. Um, so I like to think of it as this might be a little forward, but we're kind of building a new fragile family study in some way. So we're still studying still physical, mental health, uh, well-being, cognitive ability, still looking at prenatal to current environment, family, neighborhood, social, our school, poverty, and social disadvantage, all those things that we are so used to studying um, here. But now we're adding things like uh, DNA, which I know you guys just had someone here who was talking about genetics. Again, won't talk too much about it. Telomere length, um, which is the ends of the chromosome, so I have lots of papers on that. Epigenetics, which is the focus of today. Gene expression, um, which again, I won't present on today. <laughs> and then uh, brain structure and function, which is a subset of our sample. And so it's really trying to link all of these things together. Um, just to be clear, I have to really thank a lot of different funding agencies, NICHD, um, the National Institute of Mental Health, um, the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, and even NIA have all funded different parts of this work, um, and then the Jacobs Foundation. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question, in part because um, our genetics grant just uh, got a, maybe I shouldn't be saying this out loud, you guys got to keep it quiet. Uh, 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 we, we got a fifth percentile on our renewal for our genetics grant. And, uh, and my understanding is, is that the uh, year 22 data collection uh, got an even better score than that. So the idea is we're going back in year 22. There's a few other grants out to try to uh, 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 work with like NHLBI, which is lung, heart, and blood. Uh, and um, yeah, so we're still continuing this up. Uh, hope to follow up at year 22 and then get a lot more. For supplementation? For in terms of? In terms of non-representative laws? Oh, that's great. Uh, not that I'm aware of. It's a great idea, though. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, one of the things that's really interesting is, um, so NIMHD, um, so Minority Health and Health Disparities, had no idea that fragile families existed until, they, until I started talking to them. And, and maybe that was just the two or three program officers, but it's not a very big institute. And they were like, really? This is a sample that has, it, it's nationally representative, and it has this many uh, minorities, and has this many low SES people? They were just stunned. Um, and yeah, there is a bit of siloing, um, and even NIA is quite interested in, in the kids, you know, so they're funding part of the, part of our work. So anyway, it's, it's really fascinating, but uh, you're right. Uh, I think that's interesting, too, about trying to find uh, the non-representativeness over time is interesting. <laughs>
so just so you know, in general, the way most of I, I do most of this biosocial work is I try to replicate other biosocial work first, um, which is pretty hard because it's done in very different samples than ours. Um, and then the other thing I really like to do is extend what we already know works in fragile families. Parental incarceration, poverty, these things we already know have effects. So do they operate through some of our biosocial uh, mechanisms? And then finally we end with a kind of exploratory work. But I, I like to do that last for, for reasons that I'll explain later. Okay, so that's, we've kind of started really broad. Now we're going into DNA methylation. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever done anything or know anything about DNA methylation? Oh, look at, wow, it's impressive. There's a pretty good, a pretty good group. Okay, uh, well, I'm going to breeze through some of this. Um, I usually like to start with this picture in part. This is, comes from Dana Dolanoy, who's at Michigan, uh, but she studies uh, the agouti gene in, in mice. Now, uh, the thing that's interesting is this is related to obesity, but it has a phenotypic characteristic before that, which is coat color. Now, these mice are actually pretty much as genetically identical as you can get with breeding mice. The difference is that they were exposed, their mothers were exposed to different amounts of uh, uh, folate in their diets um, in utero, and it changes their phenotypic uh, patterns through epigenetic properties. So same DNA, very different outcomes. So it's the environment influencing the DNA uh, and the way it functions. So what is DNA methylation? It's one of many types of epigenetic measures, uh, mechanisms, and they have lots of different outcomes, uh, including, for example, women have uh, two X chromosomes. Men only have one. You can't have both of them operating, so one of them is silenced through epigenetic properties. Um, so methylation specifically is, is this one right here with, does this have a pointer on it? I'm always nervous because so some of these have a button that if you push it, it turns it off. And some of them, it's the pointer. OK, so there's the methyl group. Um, and so that's a carbon and three hydrogens. It attaches to the cytosine. And um, that's essentially what's happening. Let me show you more specifically. Uh, actually, these are a little out of order. OK, I'm going to go back to this other page in just a second. So, um, so this is like a methyl group. This is methyl group attaching to a cytosine and changes it. If this is your normal DNA cell, what ends up happening is you have these, uh, what we call CPG, because it's a cytosine and then a phosphate, guanine. Um, and you have these places that have opportunities for methylation to land, for a methyl group to land on it. And if you have clusters of them before a gene, that's called a promoter, or a CPG island. And if they're unmethylated, typically that means that the gene will function. And if they're methylated, like over here in the promoter region, then the gene doesn't function as much, doesn't produce as much. That's essentially, that's the very basic version of what's going on. Um, so why does it do that? Um, this will go back to that other slide. So this is a, a beautiful baby, great, wonderful cells all over the place. All of those cells have the exact same DNA. So how does it tell the difference between a blood cell versus a brain cell versus uh, fat cells, nerve cells? The way it does it is through epigenetic properties. So it's really uh, cell differentiation is the primary function of epigenetics. Um, we like to talk about it as though it's like the way the environment gets under the skin. This is actually the primary function of epigenetics. That's almost true of all biological measures that we have. The primary function is, has nothing to do with the environment. It's doing something else. Um, and that's true here. And that'll, we'll come back to this in a second. But the reason, like I said, that we find it methylation particularly interesting is that it can change over time and with exposure. So if you look at this, these chromosomes, these are uh, different chromosomes, 1, 3, 12, and 17. doesn't really matter. That's three-year-old twins, identical twins. Yellow means that the, the methylation patterns are highly correlated on the chromosome between the two twins. So it's pretty highly correlated. In fact, you start pretty much identical uh, genome, pretty much identical methylation, slightly different because one was closer to the placenta than the other. Um, 
But then as you get, oh, that's, that was, see, is, that's what I was afraid of. Um, as, you, as you get older, you become less similar, far less similar, so that you become more, more like a sibling who uh, has genetically similar but potentially uh, very different exposures. So that's what we're interested in. It changes over time. So why even study these epigenetic measures specifically? As I mentioned before, it could be a mediator of exposure risk, and that's really what I'll focus most of my time on today. It could be a moderator. Again, I won't get into that too much. Let me give you two quick examples, though, of things that I find really fascinating that we're doing some work on. It could be a biomarker of exposure. So one of the things that we're working on with Kelly Bukulski in the School of Public Health um, is trying to determine whether or not we can look at someone's epigenome and figure out whether or not their mother was smoking when she was pregnant with them. Now we have some measures of that in the fragile families data. They also have some measures um, in other samples and we've pretty much got it down now where we can predict with pretty high reliability whether or not someone uh, was smoking uh, when they had w with their child, uh, when they were pregnant with their child. Why is that interesting? Well, think about a study, another study I work with, the health and retirement study. They can't really ask that question, but we can probably predict whether or not their mother was smoking. Um, and that is distinct from whether or not they were exposed to smoke after the fact. Um, so interesting, potentially interesting for other things. Smoking is an easy one because it has a really big effect on the methylome, but uh, you could imagine all sorts of other ones, social, uh, toxicant exposures, things like that. So uh, the other one is potentially a, an epigenetic marker of disease. Even if I can't show that it's mediating, wouldn't it be nice to know whether or not someone's going, uh, has a higher probability of having a disease? And then we can narrow down other mechanisms after the fact. So we're doing something similar uh, to this with uh, several different outcomes that I'll show you uh, a little bit later. So uh, right now, we currently have about 980 of our 5,000 kids with, with DNA methylation at age 9 and age 15. So they're both at age 9 and 15. Um, and that's on the Illumina 450K, uh, for those of you who care about that. And we're trying to do work that examines the effect of poverty, parental incarceration, neighborhood violence, puberty, harsh parenting, and genetics on that. The nice thing is, is this year, through NIMHD, we are adding up to 2,400 kids with DNA methylation at two points in time. So that's actually going to end up being the largest child sample uh, in the United States, two points in time. So pretty big uh, deal, and so we're really excited about it. It's going to have a slightly different chip, um, and that has some issues that I'm happy to talk about if someone really cares. Okay, so you guys have been waiting around. I know, it takes forever to get to the results. Um, uh, so here, I'm just going to tell you right now, you are the first people to ever see this. Um, I like you so much. Uh, uh, there's a lot of other things I could present on, so we're going to see how this goes. Uh, but I'll tell you, uh, you know, uh, in general, what I'm interested in here in doing this study is the effects of poverty and parental incarceration. I'm going to focus on those. At birth, uh, we'll get to other time points. So I wanted it before the kid could start having an effect on really anything. Uh, so these are things as measured the year before the child was born, really. And then adolescent, so this is age 15 behavior, uh, problem behaviors. And uh, I can talk more about that. And so these are the epigenetic profiles at age 9 and 15. So just to be clear, if I take uh, uh, the poverty ratio at birth and try to predict adolescent externalizing behaviors, which are things like, is the child cruel? This is reported by the mother. Uh, cruel, does he bully? Um, destroy things belonging to the family, disobedient at home, disobedient at school. Those are the external type of behaviors. We have 20 items. If you try to predict, if poverty tries to predict it, controlling for uh, um, city and, um, and marital status at birth and all sorts of race, uh, all sorts of other measures, pretty robust, significant effect. Not, not, not that surprising. We've seen this over and over again. Um, however, I will point out, you'll notice uh, a lot of heterogeneity around that line, right? There's a lot of people uh, who have really high scores that are nowhere near that line, and uh, also we don't have a lot of very, very wealthy people. 
the line isn't quite as strong if you like limit it to five and below, but it's still a, a significant relationship. Um, father incarceration. Uh, now this is a measure, uh, we asked both the mother and the father over different times, uh, were you ever incarcerated? So this isn't, they were incarcerated when the child was born. This is even just before. So this is really an indicator of, of uh, not necessarily exposure to a father who's been incarcerated at the time. This is before the child was even born. Um, and there, again, pretty significant effect, actually really big effect of parental incarceration. Has all sorts of uh, other, uh, we can delve into all the mechanisms for why that is social and otherwise. But the point is, strong effect. Yeah. So here it's controlling for race uh, and uh, again, uh, kind of the classic fragile families, things like yeah, the city fixed effects, um, uh, even uh, income and, uh, and then a different model with education in it. Um, and I'm trying to think what else, uh, yeah. The gender, gender of child uh, and yeah, we have a few other covariates. I saw someone else. Um, so this is controlling for marital status at, uh, at birth. Yeah, yeah, sorry. This is controlling for all of those things. Um, trying to think what else. I tried to keep it pretty simple just to have starting with this is like the best you can hope for a fact size. Um, and then just, I won't go into the show you all the graphs. Uh, we also have this a, a pretty, a, a much weaker effect of poverty on internalizing behaviors in adolescence. Um, and a uh, weaker effect of father incarceration internalizing. Um, I've yet to figure out why the internalizing behaviors almost always have much weaker associations than externalizing, but they do. So you might ask, how are we going to measure epigenetics? There was a paper published, an EWAS paper. So you've all heard of GWAS. Um, because uh, we're so clever, uh, instead of doing a GWAS, now we do an EWAS, which is epigenome-wide association study. Exactly the same thing. We take these, in, in this case, 450,000 uh, indicators and associate and, and run regressions with, um, in this case, it was uh, oppositional defiant uh, disorder and uh, ADHD. It's as close as we could get to kind of externalizing behaviors. And this was done in the ALSPAC sample. Uh, so it's kids, but they're uh, uh, UK kids. Um, so very different population than ours. And then you produce this uh, Manhattan plot. I think you guys have seen this before, but with genetics, this is epigenetics. Same idea. These are p-values, uh, log p-value on the y-axis. On the x-axis is the chromosome, so it's just kind of an address. Um, and, and then for internalizing behavior, there's uh, a similar study, but on anxiety and depression in adults. So again, not our samples, but this is as good as we have right now. So what do we do with this? Um, there's lots of things we can do. One way to create this is the exact same way that we think about a polygenic risk score or polygenic score. Again, I think you guys have seen that before, right? The, the general idea is you're taking an effect size for each of those, um, uh, each of these uh, dots has an effect size associated with it, and you're multiplying it by whatever the person's methylation is, and that usually runs from zero to one for each of these sites, and uh, and then you add it all together, and that it would be someone's epigenetic prediction of whether or not they will have. ADHD or uh, oppositional defiant disorder or anxiety or whatever it is. Pretty basic, um, but surprisingly uh, predictive for polygenic scores. This is still very new for epigenetic data. So that's what we have. So these are all coming up in kind of funny ways. I'm sorry. Um, so on the left, uh, should be the relationship between poverty and the epigenetic profile at age nine, specifically. So uh, you'll see a pretty strong relationship, and I'll show you the betas in just a second. Um, but there is a pretty strong relationship between poverty ratio and this epigenetic profile that, remember, is supposed to predict uh, adolescent uh, externalizing behaviors. And the same is actually true for uh, family, uh, for father incarceration. 
So what does that actually look like? So, um, so the betas are, are a little hard to interpret in part because the epigenetic profile ends up becoming a really large, weird number. And so uh, you standardize it, mean of zero, standard deviation of one. Um, so interpret it that way. Um, so here you have poverty, or you have the poverty ratio to be more specific at birth, um, has uh, a very small but significant effect. Um, that Z statistic is 4.4. Um, in other words, there is a social effect um, on epigenetic profiles. And then that same profile is predictive of externalizing behaviors. Now that's a much bigger beta. Part of that is because, um, so the externalizing behaviors are counts, um, essentially. Uh, they end up becoming uh, something like a count. And um, now you're talking about a one standard deviation change. So it's a much bigger change um, in these profile scores. So it's a big effect. However, um, keep in mind that this score was purposely created to kind of measure externalizing traits. So it's not surprising that it's predictive. Um, in fact, if I take the internalizing epigenetic score, it doesn't predict uh, uh, externalizing behaviors at all. Um, and you see this, a similar effect uh, with father incarceration, similar size. Uh, it's a little bit stronger, actually, for father incarceration. Yeah, so, um, so, fa no, so father incarceration is positive, but poverty, uh, the poverty ratio, the higher the poverty ratio. So in other words, the more wealthy they are. Yeah, yeah. So, so, that's, what, yeah, so that's what this was for. And I don't know why these, these slides came back. Yeah, so as poverty ratio goes down, the epigenetic score that's predictive of externalizing behaviors goes down. So it's in the right direction. It's not as true for internalized behaviors. That's, this is the one that's been a little confusing to me. Um, hold on. Sorry. So just to kind of uh, continue with this, so you remember we had that effect. That's what the red is for, is when it was just that, just poverty and e uh, externalizing behaviors and uh, father incarceration and externalizing behaviors. So um, when you put it all in a model, structural equation model, or you put it however you want to do it, uh, We've done it several different ways just to make sure it was robust, um, including, and I should mention this, uh, so this is, these are uh, OLS regressions coefficients. But if you looked at that distribution, you would say, like, boy, that's a really skewed distribution. Maybe you should try a Poisson or a Zeller inflated Poisson or negative binomial. Regardless of how you do that, the, the same relationships that exist. Um, the coefficients change, of course, because of uh, you're transforming the data. But there is um, a slight reduction, right, in the effect size between uh, uh, when it's all by itself versus when it has that indirect effect through epigenetic profiles at nine. Not as much of a change uh, for the father incarceration. Would I claim now that I've found a mediation through epigenetic data? I mean, what would you do if you were me? I should be, right? right? This is really exciting. No one's ever shown this before. So it's really exciting. But there are so many other things that can go wrong here. Um, and I'll get to those in a second. But I wanted you to just have a sense that, yes, poverty and father incarceration are influencing uh, epigenetic profiles. I've never seen father incarceration ever associated with methylation profiles. So that's a first. Poverty, we've kind of already known a little bit before. And these are profile scores that should be related to externalizing behaviors. Um, internalizing behaviors, uh, a, a slightly more complex story, um, in part because I think that internal, the internalizing score for epigenetic profiles wasn't as good, and also the relationship between poverty and father incarceration isn't as strong. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I was just out of curiosity, did you compare the polygenic risk score for externalizing uh, behaviors with the epigenetic profile score? And, and how correlated are they? That's a great question. Yes. Uh, that's coming later, but I'm glad you asked it now. No, no, no. I, I, I just mentioned it a little bit. So, one of the things you might think is well, 
it's not really epigenetics here. This is genetics, under, underlying genetics. Now, there aren't really good genetic scores for uh, externalizing behavior directly. Um, the child samples just aren't big enough at this point. Um, but when we've tried to do either ADHD or uh, some other sorts of risk-taking behaviors, anything we can get our hands on that's closer, including there is one smaller epigenetic, or not epigenetic, externalizing score on a much smaller sample of kids than I think probably it should be. Um, you can put those in there, and they are not highly correlated with the epigenetic scores. Um, and that uh, doesn't really change any of these coefficients. Um, I'll get to other genetic measures that might be more important than, say, an epigenetic or a genetic score of externalizing behavior. Um, but well, we can talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's white. Yeah. 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 Right. Right. Is not. <laughs> so, did you control for um, like principal components or, or something? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm gonna. That's another. That's a little further down slide as well. But yes. So uh, I mean. So one of the things that's that's challenging to do is. Um, so within, within. Uh, well, I'll get to it in a little bit. But yes, I did control for uh, principal components, genetic principal components, um, and. Uh, yeah, these are robust. I mean, these are actually controlling for. Uh, once I put epigenetic data in there, um, I control for ancestry. So pr principal components. Yes? Just a clarification. When you sure. Oh, uh, so that is a wonderful idea. We do not have parents' genetic data yet. We have the samples. The new proposal that I just mentioned got a fifth percentile is to add uh, the genetic measures of the mothers, um, but we can't do it right now. That's really interesting. Um, right, so, so one thing you might think about, so this is, um, if people are following this literature, the genetic nurturance, uh, part of it is that the genes of the parents influence the child through a couple different mechanisms. One is directly through their genes, right? They transmit half of their genome to their child. Um, the other thing is that they transmit, uh, you know, uh, through behavior. So those genes still are affecting their own behavior, like parenting or selection into different environments, which is then affecting the child. So it's operating through both. Parents' genes are both operating through genetic pathways and social pathways. So potentially, this genetic uh, score of the parents could be influencing both poverty, potentially father incarceration, and, and then influencing uh, all of the rest of these uh, scores. I don't know, that's, that's going to be interesting. I, I, wish I, I wish I could think that many derivatives in, ahead. Uh, but um, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, yes, we have the same problem that we always have with the environment in this case. I mean, so this is more like a social science data problem, right, where things can change. So there's some environment that's uh, influencing both father incarceration and epigenetic profiles. And it could be even a non-social sort of, uh, it could be some sort of toxicant exposure, or it could be some structural measure that we're not capturing here. Um, yes. Uh, so part of it is is controlling for all all that we can control for, and then um, if I follow uh, you know Jason's uh, example, we would start looking for um, some sort of exogenous shock to the environment to see how that influences epigenetic measures. I mean, this is kind of a first run. This is why I say like you guys are seeing things as it's being done, which I'm really grateful for all the feedback. Uh, so please keep it coming. But yes, you're right. Um, let me, so, oh, this is internalizing behaviors. You guys have been looking at this kind of the same, but it's, it's, it's much, it's just mar much harder for me to get my head around this. I did it kind of a parallel study because people always say, well, you did it for externalizing behaviors. What about for internalizing behaviors? 
It just uh, doesn't quite work as well, but it's still significant-ish. Um, I like to see much bigger p-values than I used to. I used to be happy with 0.05. I kind of expect to see two or three zeros now uh, for lots of different reasons. Um, so some of the other results. Yeah, go ahead, Felix. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So that is uh, that's the effect of uh, the poverty ratio, or this, the correlation coefficient, really, between the poverty ratio and adolescent internalizing behaviors. So it's poverty ratio at birth. Yes. Yeah. So that's the total. Yes. That would be C, and now C prime is 0 0.003 with a z statistic of 1.5. Yes, say, thank you. You guys are like, oh, now I understand what he's doing. OK. Good. Thank you, Felix. So, so that's where we are. Let me talk about some of the other results. Uh, in, in, uh, I know we have some time remaining, but we have a lot of other things to cover. Um, so we did, so I, was, I started at birth, right? I mean, that's the reason for that for me in my, my mind, and I'll get to this a little bit later too, um, the child hasn't had a chance to really affect the environment yet in any way. Um, also, um, as I'll show you later, the epigenome is really quite sensitive in utero and in the first year. So anything I can get kind of before that starts is really helpful. But what we find is essentially the poverty, uh, poverty measures, if you start putting them together, looking at trajectories, different ways of measuring that, it's really driven by the poverty measure at birth, at age one, and then it pretty much uh, declines after that point. If you control for multiple measures um, of the poverty ratio or even mother's education, um, which doesn't change a ton, obviously, uh, it's really all set pretty early on. Um, I know what you really would love to hear is that there was a massive change in these epigenetic profile scores and that I found a big effect of the environment on those because then that means that we can change them back the other way. That's not what I found. Um, I found very little change between 9 and 15 on these particular scores. There are other parts of the epigenome that change dramatically by age um, and by different exposures. These did not. It was pretty stable between 9 and 15. Kind of interesting, actually, how little change. And therefore, it's not a surprise that changes in the context weren't associated with any of the minor changes in the scores. Um, we started getting into some neighbor, we're doing this right now, uh, some neighborhood measures to try to get a little further back from the family. Uh, and so uh, and those results are not as strong as family uh, income, uh, but are still the relationship still holds uh, in general. Uh, so, so I said I would mention a little bit, we have two different measures of uh, brain uh, function uh, in uh, the Fragile Families subsample. This is a 240 kids. Um, one of them is a faces task where they show uh, different emotional faces. Um, and you're actually trying to pick which gender so you don't know that you're trying to do that. What it does is it triggers a response in the brain that is essentially a fear response. Um, an anxiety response. And it's pretty predictive of depression uh, in adults. And what we see is that these epigenetic scores for internalizing behavior do predict the response to fearful faces. In other words, uh, people who have higher internalizing epigenetic scores also have higher responses to uh, kind of negative emotion. Um, and uh, we have another one that I haven't had a chance to run yet that's more about reward and sensation seeking, but, uh, but I can't talk too much more about that because I haven't really had a chance to really dive into it yet. Um, the whole point behind this is just to try to like see, is this, you know, like at what point is this, this has got to fall apart. Um, and I already mentioned this, genetics of ADHD and anxiety depression, when you control for those measures, the results stay. Um, those scores are not particularly strong, so I don't know that I have a lot of confidence in them, but it's what we have right now. Um, and eventually, uh, since we will actually have, uh, so I mentioned that these EWAS scores came from like uh, 
uh, AllSpac and some of these others, they're based on like 600 kids. We'll have 2,400 kids. We actually have bigger samples than a lot of other people. And we're actually working with a few other samples to try to get a, a bigger meta-analysis of doing an EWAS of externalizing behavior in fragile families. So that's kind of our next kind of big thing. Um, so in the remaining minutes, let me just both go into other reasons why this is probably wrong. And um, maybe you might be interested to learn uh, some more about epigenetics. So uh, DNA methylation is critical to development. Um, we've already talked a little bit about that. There are large shifts throughout development, but by that we mean shifts in uh, pro um, predominantly in utero and maybe a little bit in the first year of life um, and, uh, and then a little bit more in um, um, uh, puberty. But otherwise, not, not as quite as much. We already talked about establishing cell lineage and that's, again, that's the primary purpose of this and I can't stress that enough. All of these biomarkers have biological functions. Those may or may not help or hurt us in doing this social and biosocial work. In this case, cell lineage. Exon activation, um, it's actually a really good marker for cancer. Um, and there's actually some imprinting uh, work. In other words, there are some methylation marks that come from the father and some that come from the mother. Um, not very many, only about 19 genes are that way. Uh, but they actually carry from the mother. In other words, they could be from other environments going back further. Um, so why do I put this image back up again? Well, here I am talking about DNA methylation in, does anyone remember? Saliva. What do I, why do I think that saliva is somehow predictive of behavior when behavior is probably run through methylation related to the brain? Right? And the brain has lots of different tissues in and of itself. So, I mean, if you go to a biological, this is the first thing, by the way, you guys ask nice, great statistical questions, great social environment questions. When I go speak at, with biologists, they ask this question in slide two. They're like, wait a second, you don't have brain. So we don't believe anything you're saying. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't really have a good answer for that. Um, Methylation in saliva, is it correlated with brain? Sure, a little bit, not really. Uh, you know, it's a little bit in some places at some times. Um, there's a lot of data. You can find a correlation somewhere. Uh, but what I'm hoping for is that some of these markers are probably things that started in utero before the cell differentiation really happened. Um, and, and if that's true, then it might explain why we don't see a lot of changes in some of these things between 9 and 15. It may be more set further back. Um, and it may explain why some of these markers are potentially correlated across multiple tissues. Um, at the end of the day, though, if it's not a real mechanism, but still just a biomarker, I'm happy with that, too. Um, there is a complication with this, though. And that is that saliva doesn't have one type of cell type. It actually has several cell types. And so if you don't account for the fact that you could have different distributions of cell types, you could actually be running into uh, a confounding problem in and of its own, which is um, my distribution of cell types in my saliva differ from someone else's for very reasonable, uh, anyway, it, it, they could differ quite substantially. And, um, that might be explaining everything. It might not have anything to do with methylation. It actually may have everything to do with the distribution of the cell types. Still interesting, but not epigenetics, right? It's a cell distribution story. Um, and actually what this is right here, so this is uh, Kelly Bukowski and I uh, were doing some work. This is some, from some of her earlier work, uh, looking at different cell types. So here she has blood versus placenta versus semen. And if you just put it all in a hopper and do uh, a, uh, you know, a sorting technique, it, it falls out perfectly. You can tell which cell distribution it is perfectly because uh, that's the first set of principal components are essentially cell distribution. Um, so how do, we, how do we deal with that? Well, the first way that we deal with it is we can use um, 
uh, kind of exploratory data analysis, like principal components of epigenetics. That's not perfect, it's okay. Um, it gets at most of the distribution, but potentially gets into some other things like batch effects. The other thing is we can use things like a reference panel. So there are uh, studies that have gone out and done, uh, taken blood, divided it up into its different cell types, and done methylation, methylation profiles of those cell types. And then you can estimate the uh, cell distribution based on those. They don't have that for saliva. Um, they only have it for blood and a few other tissues. So one of the nice things is, is uh, Michigan gave us a grant to do exactly that for fragile families to go and actually go, go to kids uh, who are at both 9 and 15, not, so not the fragile families kids anymore, and get spit, split up their uh, cell types and run methylation profiles on each of those so that we can then reconstitute it, predict cell types within saliva, both for fragile families and for all the other saliva-based studies. Um, so right now we're doing a okay job of controlling for this, but it could still potentially be explaining some. It could be just that uh, kids who are in poverty have more T cells because there's more inflammation, so therefore that's explaining this relationship. Um, the other big thing to know, I won't spend too much time on this, um, is batch effects. So batch effects are not unlike interviewer effects, but bigger and scarier. Um, so interviewer effects, we know that pretty well from survey data. Um, within methylation, it is very possible that a batch effect, and by a batch I mean, um, so each methylation is, uh, is run, run on an, uh, an array or a slide um, with eight arrays or uh, 12 arrays, depending on, on how you're doing it. Um, and they run at different times. So we run like 96 um, in, a, in a plate. Um, and that takes time. And so over time, the machine changes a little bit. The humidity changes a little bit. The reagents that are used change a little bit. And each of those end up resulting in batch effects. So that things run at the beginning are slightly different than things run at the end, even if you had the exact same samples. Um, so how bad can this be? Um, I was part of a project, I won't name the name, but they put all of the cases in one batch and all of the controls in another batch and um, had this huge effect. And they, we were all so excited because it had this big effect. And then we controlled for batch and everything disappeared. Um, it's really bad. It can explain sometimes 25% to 40% of your variance, depending on the lab that's conducting it, so a lot. A lot of your epigenetic variants may be wrapped up into batch effects. Um, we have several different ways that we account for that. Some are technical in that we put samples in, repeat samples in our batches so that we can then control for that. Um, it's very expensive to do that, but that's, we do that. Um, and then we can try to adjust for it through other statistical means. But it's a real thing. Anytime someone talks about epigenetic data, Ask about batch effects. Um, the other thing, we talked a little bit about this. Um, genes are related to methylation. And in fact, if you have a SNP, so single nucleotide polymorphism, and methylation is right on top of it, um, it can change it based on if it's TT, where methylation can't, uh, uh, you can't have a methyl group that attaches to that, versus CC, where they can, it can change the methylation from 0 to 100%. So this is literally genetics determining pretty much what the methylation level is. The way we get around that is all of the measures I just talked about, we actually remove all of the CPG sites that have this relationship. Um, and so it still holds up, but this is another way that we have to deal with it. Um, so we asked a little bit about this before. I won't go into this into too much detail. So, so most Epigenetic studies until two or three years ago were run on uh, European ancestry or uh, more specifically uh, white samples. Um, and so, like we were talking about before, there is a genetic component to this. This is using the genetic data. And maybe this is just helpful to remember this whenever you see anything about genetic data and race or ancestry and how that links together. So let me start on the far right. The far right are self-reported white participants of fragile families. Um, 
this isn't the whole sample. It was like the first thousand, and we created the slide, and we need to create a new one. So what you can see there, um, if you had all the HapMap groups memorized, you would know the different uh, groups that that measures. But I can tell you that the purple um, is mostly no Northwest Europeans. Um, if you really want to get technical, uh, Northwest Europeans who live in Utah. Um, and then the top part is uh, Italian. So white are typically uh, made up of ancestries that are highly correlated with Northwest European and, and uh, Southern European. Okay, you can kind of see that. You can see how that, that looks. Um, we'll save Hispanic for a second. Uh, if we go to self-reported black, um, if you look at this top part here, so, so these are different uh, ancestry groups that are uh, from Africa itself. Up here, though, that again, if that, those colors look familiar, those are European. This is the same European ancestries. So there's a fair amount of mixture uh, in self-reported black, right? Um, which is really important to keep in mind. Um, and then if you get to Hispanic, um, there's a lot more mixture, uh, which you'd expect, a lot of admixture. My point is to say the following. Genetics, when it comes to genetics, we often talk about things as ancestries. And you can see that if you were self-reported as white, you're probably European ancestry, pretty specifically one or two or three types. Uh, if you self-report as, or someone self-reports as black or Hispanic, not nearly as clear the ancestry, far more diversity in ancestry. And so does race and uh, ancestry correlate? Yes, clearly within the white sample, it's pretty clear how that line lines up. Any of the other ones, it's far more difficult, right? So they don't, I, I would argue that they don't quite line up, which makes it really hard if you're studying social disadvantage or health inequalities, which are determined by uh, self-reported race or ethnicity, um, and you're including biomarkers, which have this genetic underpinning on, on them that are ancestry-based, how do you put the two together? Um, and so the way we, we have to do it, or the way we do it, um, is by controlling for what we can possibly control for. Uh, we talked about principal components, um, which gets at ancestry also control for self-reported race. We, we try to go back and forth um, and see how the results hold up. And then we run everything separately by ancestry, separately by race. Um, it's not easy, uh, but I think it's really important. And just to, just to point this out a little bit more, um, for a long time we only studied this group um, because it was so much easier to study to some degree. Um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be studying all of the other groups. Um, I would argue that we do. And actually, one of the things that we're finding is we're learning quite a bit more from the genome um, as we've started to be better about measuring non-European ancestries. And if you want to talk more about that, uh, Jason has all sorts of uh, great insights. It was a great paper. So um, let me wrap this up. Uh, just to say, uh, so again, why would social scientists care? We kind of covered a few different versions of this. Um, talked a little bit about mechanisms. We'll see if that's really a mechanism. We don't have a causal uh, model, right? We don't have an exogenous shock of either the environment or the epigenome. Um, we didn't talk at all about moderation, but this is why I think people might care, why you might care. Um, if you're at all interested, and learning from people who uh, I uh, work with. Um, I mean, yes, I'll be there. Yes, I'll give a lecture. Uh, but there are far smarter people and more engaging people than me. Um, we are having our third year of our genetics for so genomics for social scientists um, this uh, June 17th through June 21st. Um, we've actually had people from here come. Uh, and the applications will probably start to open uh, November 1st, which I'm pretty sure is in two days. Um, so, and I'm happy to ask, answer any questions about that. We do cover a whole day on epigenetics, although it's so popular that we're actually writing a, an administrative supplement to have its own special epigenetics, social scientists for, uh, with epigenetics uh, training, um, because uh, it takes a lot to, 
to work through epigenetic data. Um, and the other thing I'll, I just want to promote a little bit is, so I have a Jacobs Foundation Early Career Fe Research Fellowship. Um, so Jacobs uh, is in Switzerland, had on lots of chocolate. That's how they have money. And they study early childhood education and, and learning. They actually, this is the science of learning. Um, really incredible opportunity. Not a lot of sociologists and demographers. In fact, I might be the only one. Uh, most of them are psychologists, but there's neuroscientists. There's a few people who do genetics. Um, so people who, who, who you might also know, like Paige Harden is one, uh, Elliot Tucker uh, Drob is one, and uh, Dan Belsky. Those are the other people who probably work in these circles that you would recognize. Most everyone else is psychologists or neuroscientists. And finally, um, people who have ever seen me give a talk have seen this slide before. Um, this is what I call the biomarker hype curve. I stole it completely from uh, information uh, sciences, um, but I think it's a very important thing to remember for all biomarkers, including epigenetics, that when we have a new technologi technological trigger, we can measure the epigenome for $300. It's great. Let's do it. Um, what happens is, it, uh, this is time and visibility, um, we start producing lots of, of, of data sets with, the, with these new measures, and um, we start saying things like, we're going to find the mechanism from poverty or parental incarceration to ADHD. Done. Exciting. Um, then what usually happens is, so someone's like right here, say, presenting at Wisconsin on a mechanism, and everyone's really excited about it, um, is in a, in a year or even a few months, um, people start saying, you know, that doesn't work. It doesn't predict. You know that you tested too many things, right? You know you forgot to account for X, Y, and Z. Um, when I use this new method, it doesn't, uh, it's not statistically valid anymore. And so then we go into this trough of disillusionment, um, which uh, was, we were talking uh, earlier today. Um, telomeres, which is what I first did, uh, I think is about right here right now. Other people might think it's over here. Um, because there's always a few people who say, no, like, we're going to make this work. We're going to focus on the methods, on how to measure it correctly, how to deal with the fact that DNA will change from the moment you spit into a tube to when it gets extracted. How does it change? Let's do experiments on that. To uh, a plateau of productivity, which is where I think things like GWAS are now. We have a better sense of what they are. I wouldn't say that about polygenic scores. I actually think polygenic scores are still in this range over here. Um, but, uh, but we know what it is. We know how to do it. We know what it's producing. Um, and with that, I think I'm done. Go ahead. Oh, I should also say, Lots of wonderful people. I'm not the only person who did this. There are so many people that I could list. I mentioned Sarah McClanahan, Irv Garfinkel, lots and lots of other people, too. Um, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Mm. Um, as, so, so we have. We have one funding mechanism. Uh, we haven't ever collected blood from the kids. We have dried blood spots from some of the kids, um, which is not quite as good for lots of reasons, especially for methylation. Um, so we have some funding to do that on a subsample. Um, we, however, we are working with the health and retirement study uh, to do some pilot work uh, on their stored blood and stored saliva and stored dried blood spots. Um, so NIA is helping fund that work right now. But yeah, um, it would be great to know more about how those link up. Um, just to be clear, though, uh, a lot of saliva samples and, and blood samples actually over a lot of the cell types overlap between the two. So we think that they could potentially correlate. Maybe. Other questions? I thought it's Felix. Oh, OK, we'll go here. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, that's actually not how I started. Uh, so one of the things I didn't mention in here was uh, gene regions. That's actually how I started with epigenetic data. Um, 
the problem is is that uh, so you have two ways of selecting candidate gene regions, right? Um, either you go based on a previous literature and select a gene region and then do a lot more exploration of epigenetics or, or you can even do like a system of genes. Um, but that's based on, on however that literature was formed. Uh, in the same way, uh, epigenetics, um, you could do an EWAS and focus on regions there. And I, I did some of that work that I didn't mention it. Um, why did I end up going this route? Part of it was uh, I was really curious as to whether or not it would predict in the same way that polygenic scores do. Um, and uh, it's a tool that I have and I can create them a, a little bit easier. Um, but it's actually not my first instinct. My first instinct was the gene regions, but those are just not predictive enough at this point. So in some ways it was to try to harness the most predictive power I could out of the epigenetic data. Um, so I started with kind of a more agnostic approach. Um, but I'm happy to switch back over to a more biologically driven approach if, if we can find better predictors. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. More. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 No. So I mean, so this score is because of the way it was created. So. So yes, yeah, so actually those two things link up quite nicely. Uh, so the way this is created, the score was created is purely, uh, you know, you have an external data set that said what methylation signals correlate with an outcome, externalizing behavior, right? There's no biology at all in that process. There's nothing about silencing. There's no genetics included. Um, it's strictly, I have 450,000 variables how well does it predict this outcome? I take that and apply it to my data set, so it's not run on my own data, so that's nice. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's predictive. And so my, it was actually kind of starting at the outcome and then epigenetics and then seeing if poverty and uh, um, incarceration predict that. You could actually do the reverse, right? You could do an EWAS of poverty or parental incarceration and see if what outcomes those things predict. Um, but it's all data driven. Um, if we wanted to go more biological, then I think what you would do is you would look at the gene. You would, if you had a candidate gene, you would look at the gene. Uh, you would determine whether or not it's doing the thing, you know, if it's promoting, say, inflammation or not. And then you would worry about is this silencing it or is it, uh, um, letting it function at a higher rate, um, and then that, that's where biology would come in. So uh, it's slightly different ways of approaching it. This is purely data driven. Yeah. Yes, and then we'll come back. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so the, the papers that created them did that. Um, I haven't done that because that's, uh, I literally took their summary statistics to create the score. So uh, um, if, when we do our EWAS, that's what we'll do. So we'll learn more about the gene ontology from, based on that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. We have one. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. It's RNA. Uh, so on that the same uh, uh, brain imaging sample, uh, they provided saliva again. Uh, so RNA from in saliva. That's um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, that's. I mean, that's ultimately. That's the goal of this next. That that same grant that I mentioned that was doing dry blood spot is paying for the RNA. So that's part of that aim is to, to look exactly that. Yeah. Thanks.
Um, I, I tend to think of it actually as the part of the mechanism, potentially part of the mechanism. Um, you know, so it's, this might be especially true if you're, say, doing, uh, if you have epigenetics in blood and you're looking at things like inflammation, then it really might be uh, a really important mechanism. It's a little bit harder to make that statement if you're, like, looking at, uh, if you have blood and you're looking at some behavior that isn't related to a blood-based, uh, you know, system um, then it's more like noise but I mean I I find it interesting in and of itself and um, so in another study that I, I, I ran uh, um, a much smaller study one of the things we found is that the epigenetics when you controlled for the cell distribution that effect disappeared but the cell distributions were predictive of the outcome of interest in this case it was PTSD that's still interesting. It's still, you know, a potential biomarker, even if it's not a direct mechanism through epigenetics. So I, I see it as potentially being both. Yeah. Okay. Oh gosh. Okay. If there are still some more questions, please feel free to come up. Um, yeah. Talk with culture afterwards. Um, thank you for joining us today. Yeah. Thank you.